my cats are having a fit right now. I'm going to pause for just a second. Sorry. That's I'm going right. to pause. Yeah. Can you hear that? They're like growling at each other and fighting. Heard that. Hello and welcome to Real Film Snobs. I'm Angela Yeager and I am pleased to present my guest host for this week, Scott Hosner. Welcome to the show, Scott. Glad to be here again. Yeah, it's been a little while uh, because you've been so busy as usual, <laughs> uh, but we are here for our annual Sundance Film Festival episode and I think you've been on the show for quite a few years now um, presenting some of your favorite picks from the Sundance Film Festival. And uh, you've always gone in person. Uh, this year they had some snafus due to the wonderful pandemic that continues to make all of our lives so wonderful. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I know that they went virtual um, fairly last minute. I, for one, was not planning to go in person anyway, so I got to experience the film festival for the first time virtually. So I'm actually going to, uh, for the first time ever, uh, actually get to review some Sundance films, mm -hmm. uh, ironically, um, even though I think this might be your last year. Uh, but why don't you, um, you know, maybe first talk about like this this transition that happened, I think, pretty last minute um, from, from being an in-person festival to fully virtual. Yeah, this year's festival was a frustrating experience for me. I, you know, last year they canceled the festival, the in-person festival, um, early on and just did a virtual festival, which was fine. I chose not to attend. After about 15 years of attending in person, I chose not to attend. It just was a, kind of burned out on sitting in front of a computer and watching films, and I didn't uh, choose to do that last year. This year, they said, hey, we're coming back. We're going to have this hybrid experience. You can buy in-person tickets. You can buy virtual tickets, whichever works. Here's all our safety protocols. And so based on the safety protocols and where I was at and vaccinated and boosted and everyone was going to have to be vaccinated and boosted and they were going to space everybody out, I decided to buy uh, an in-person experience. I did that at the last minute because I, in case they canceled, but they kept saying, hey, here's the deadline, here's the deadline, here's the deadline, better buy your tickets. So at the very last minute, I decided I'm going to go for it. I bought my tickets. And then like 48 hours later, they canceled the in-person festival. And what was extraordinarily frustrating is that they refused to give refunds for those of us that bought in-person tickets. Um, instead, they just transitioned our tickets to virtual, essentially charging us four times as much as they were charging the general public for the same thing, and they wouldn't budge. And it was so frustrating that I'm pretty certain this will be the last year that I have any involvement with the Sundance Festival. I'm very frustrated by that, but I'm kind of once bitten, twice shy kind of guy. And they just ripped us off and they did it to hundreds and hundreds of people and they didn't listen to our complaints. They didn't bend. I'm still disputing it with my credit card company, whatever. But um, they just kind of burned me and I'm just probably done with Sundance and I'll find another film festival that we can do on real film snobs in the future. Well the good news is there are a lot of great film festivals out there. I've attended, you know, the Ashland one for years and they've done um, and of course that's not big like Sundance, but you know, they did a really good job after the first year of COVID, you know, in 2020 having problems with going virtual, which I totally understand the first time having issues with your virtual platform. Last year, Ashland really stepped it up and it was almost a flawless experience. Uh, multiple other film festivals have, have done the same thing. I know that other film festivals like Palm Springs canceled entirely, didn't even do virtual. Um, this year, I'm really excited. I'm gonna get to go to the South by Southwest Film Festival um, due to my sort of regular co-host, Ernie. Um, and um, they're doing a hybrid of virtual <clears throat> and in person. But um, there's some great film festivals out there that also show, you know, big movies like Sundance. It is nice, though, that Sundance does give a platform for independent filmmakers. And I know that's one of the reasons you wanted to continue supporting them. So you were able to watch some of the movies virtually. I only have been watching things virtually, of course. Mm -hmm. But um, we're going to talk about some of the films we saw today. I will mention that as a first time um, attendee on the virtual platform, I was really um, pretty surprised at how bad their website was and their 
their their app um, that they encouraged you to use through Roku, um, which is what I used, um, you couldn't access any of the talks. You had to go onto the website to do that. You couldn't do it through the app. Whereas like other film festivals I've attended and I've done three or four virtual film festivals um, during COVID um, that used um, platforms like Eventive, um, everything was seamless. You watch the movie and then could also go straight into the talk on the app. To me, it didn't make any sense that I have to then shut off my TV and go to the website to participate in the, the talk backs. So there was a lot of issues with it just not, it's a pretty clunky virtual experience. So hopefully they're able to get that worked out. But I know we don't want to spend all of our time mm -hmm. griping because we want to do talk about some of the great films. And I'm really happy because I researched my films thoroughly. And I'm really happy to talk about the three films that I'm yeah. going to talk about. Why don't you start with your your first one? You bet. Well, um, after they canceled the in-person festival, I ended up attending uh, some screenings with some friends virtually. Um, and, uh, you know, the, what I'll say is there weren't any home runs this year in the film selection I had, but the best thing about this year was, uh, at least in the selection of films we saw, was about 80% of the films were directed by women this year of the screenings we watched, and all three of the films that I'm going to talk about are directed by women, and I think that is that is showing some advancement in the in the world of film and certainly an in independent film and, and like you say one of the things that Sundance has has focused on um so the first film I want to talk about the first of my three three star films none of these are four star films unfortunately but they're all worth checking out um, they just had their flaws um but the the first film I want to talk about is good luck to you Leo Grande um this is a, a very quiet um, film uh, with just a couple of characters. Uh, Emma Thompson plays a uh, aging school teacher uh, who's recently widowed and is sexually frustrated. She's had a very um, vanilla sex life her entire life and I think has, uh, has dreamt of more adventure. Uh, and she hires a sex worker played by a lovely man, Daryl McCormick, um, who uh, comes to their ho the hotel room that she has rented uh, for this experience and turns into a couple hours of conversations primarily between Emma Thompson and this sex worker um, because she, she almost backs out about a dozen times and is really afraid to, to uh, go through with this. There's actually, it turns into several meetings over the period of months in the same hotel room. So the film has a very limited scope and it's a lot of conversation between these two characters as they actually develop a friendship. Emma Thompson is very, is very vulnerable in this film as an aging woman and she embraces that. Um, it's not a graphic film, it's largely conversation, um, but eventually does become a little bit graphic <laughs> toward the end, you know, on a scale of, you know, American films, uh, and Emma Thompson just embraces it. Um, her performance is very sympathetic and one that uh, those of us that are aging can kind of start to appreciate, I think. Um, it, it really was very funny at times, very poignant at times, and a little bit sad. Um, I did enjoy it very much, uh, and it was easy to watch. If I, the, the, perhaps the reason it, it got three stars in my book instead of four is it was, it was a little long, I think. I think they could have trimmed 20 or 30 minutes out of it um, mm -hmm. and had a more compact story because there was a certain amount of repetition uh, in the dialogue and in the um, sequences that could have been trimmed a little bit. But overall, a really interesting uh, introspective on aging and sexuality and the dynamic between a very young, very handsome sex worker and an aging woman who still had a lot to offer. And I'll tell you, if sex workers were really like this guy, <laughs> it would be a much more successful profession, I think. It, he, he is perfect in every way, and then his handling of um, Emma Thompson is, is uh, really sweet. Um, and uh, enjoyed it. It's worth checking out. Well, yeah, I was excited to see that one. And I that was one I was interested in. I have to admit that one of my strategies when I pick films for, for film festivals is to pick often the ones that don't have big stars in them because I assume those will get picked up and I'll be able to see them eventually. Not always, but a lot of times. So this one I thought, oh, Emma Thompson, and there was a lot of buzz about it going in. So I thought it'll probably get picked up for distribution. But I love Emma Thompson. Um, I think she's really underutilized and, you know, like a lot of older actresses. So 
I'm super excited to see that one when it comes out. Okay, so uh, we will move on to my first film, uh, which is actually the first film I think I saw of the film festival. Oh, we got a kitty on screen. We're, we're big fans of kitties on screen on real film stuff. So uh, my first film is Nanny um, by director Nick Yatu Jusu. And it's about a Senegalese woman played by the great Anna Diop, uh, who takes a job as a nanny for a wealthy New York couple um, in order to bring in money, to raise money, to bring her own child um, home, uh, who's still in Senegal. And as she's, um, you know, taking her time to get to know this family and trying to do this job, things to start to unravel, it's, uh, it's built as a horror film. I would call it more of a psychological thriller, really, than a a horror film and like the it's not a slasher film in, in those types of regards um it's really the the great performance by anna diop at the at the center not only is she just dropped dead gorgeous but she's also plays this woman who's in this space it's very uncomfortable the the couple that she works for aren't necessarily evil they have their own issues going on but they are very privileged and they are often pretty um uh, almost absurdly privileged and not realizing the, the situation they often put her in last minute requests to stay overnight to watch their child because they want to go to a party or function and um, forgetting to pay her things like that and uh, as the stress builds up um, she starts to sort of start to see things as she realizes she may not make her goal of bringing her son home by a certain date I loved this film it has a gorgeous look to it it's a very kind of um you know, it's bringing in some of that West African flavor to both the music and the score, but also the look of the film. And it really gets at this experience of alienation of someone who is, you know, uh, in a, a foreign land, really, you know, where she's trying to struggle to, um, you know, make ends meet, um, you know, find her way in this new place, but also being separated from her child while she cares for someone else's child. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you know, the little girl that she's caring for is a very sweet little girl that she really actually likes quite a bit, but it's just this, this tension inherent in the fact that she's giving up her own life to care for this white couple's child. So I loved the film as first time director. It was funded by Sundance. Shockingly, even though it won the um, Sundance Jury Award, and it was the first quote unquote horror movie to ever want, win in the US dramatic competition for the Jury Award. Um, it has not found a distributor yet. So I'm really hopeful that it does, at least from what I could find online. I was searching, I did not see any uh, thing about that, which, you know, I could sort of see why it's, it's troubling material, but it was one of my favorite um, films of the festival by far. Well, it seems like there's been a number of films recently that have kind of explored this intersection between race and culture and, and class and then kind of turned it into a horror film. But I think, of how does this film compare to like Get Out in the sense of a horror film versus a state? It's a lot right? less scary than Get Out. See, I think it's much more of a psychological thriller because I didn't really feel scare like get out has some truly scary moments it's also very funny this film takes it's very serious to me it's more of a dramatic movie with like thriller or horror elements at times uh because it, it it's really more what's going on in her mind as the stress of the situation starts to get to her um but then i think that um so it's it's quite a bit different than that i think but I, I just loved everything about it. So I'm really excited. I hope it finds distribution somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I do too. It sounds like a really interesting ride and I'd love to check it out. Um, my next film is called Call Jane. And interesting, I think that the one of the reasons this film was, was uh, enjoyable to watch and a little bit scary to watch is the... Um, is because of the times we're in. This is a film um, about in the early 70s. Um, it features or it focuses on a, a woman um, in her early 30s, I think, who finds herself unexpectedly pregnant and um, abortion is illegal. And she seeks out um, an, an abortion, an illegal abortion. Uh, she has resources. She's very upper middle class and she can do that. Um, but it's still an, an uncomfortable and scary experience for her. But she is fascinated by this group of women um, led kind of this this clan kind of led by Sigourney Weaver um, who have created this network 
of support for women who are seeking uh, abortion services, safe, although illegal abortion services. And um, the woman ends up, uh, the main character played by Elizabeth Banks, who just um, eats up this role, becomes involved personally and starts volunteering for this organization and helping other women and eventually learns the techniques of their doctor, who's quite a male chauvinist who's performing these services. Uh, she ends up assisting him for a while and then taking over some and eventually becoming the primary uh, doctor, although she's not licensed, and then trains other women. Um, and mm -hmm. what's it, uh, what a part of, of course, what makes this film relevant is the time we're in right now, because it's likely that we're going to be back in a similar situation in about six or eight months um, when the Supreme Court rules. It's likely that a lot of states are going to find abortion illegal again. This is a based on a true story um, of a group called the Janes. Um, that's the kind of the message they put up in phone booths and that sort of thing. Pregnant, scared, call Jane. Um, and coincidentally, this film directed by Phyllis Nagy is at the festival the same year, a documentary called The Janes also premiered at Sundance, which is a documentary about the same group of folks. And so I got to see both films. And so it's very interesting to see, of course, the dramatic adaptation of the story along with the documentary. Um, and you liked the fictional version better than the documentary or? It was, you know, quote unquote, more enjoyable, I think, um, than the documentary. Uh, the documentary was very kind of standard fare. Um, there wasn't much that, um, and I saw them in that order too. I saw the dramatic one first, and I and perhaps if I'd seen the documentary first, I might have flipped which one was more interesting, you know, because I've learned much of the story already by seeing the the dr dramatized version first. So it's a, you know, I, I debated which one of these I would, um, you know, feature and which one would be the add on. The reality was they were both three star films, both worth checking out certainly um, worth considering what we might be going back to in many states in this country soon. Yeah, it sounds really powerful and what a great cast. I'm big and nice to see Elizabeth Banks get a, um, a meaty role to sink her teeth into. She usually does a lot of comedy, so that's really nice to see. Okay, so our next film is Descendant, which is a documentary by Margaret Brown. And it follows the descendants of the survivors of the Clotilda, which is the last ship that ever carried enslaved Africans to America. Just so happens that this happened um, decades, many decades after the practice was made illegal in the United States. Um, a group of uh, white businessmen and leaders in, um, in this town in Alabama just basically placed a bet back in the 1800s that they thought they could build a ship, take it to Africa, and bring back um, enslaved people. And they did it. And then they burned the remnants of the ship because at the time in the US, um, it was actually, you would receive the death penalty for receive, uh, for bringing slaves over. And so uh, the people in this town have grappled with this history ever since because it, it was a, it's kind of a legend, like nobody ever found the ship, but it also shows this direct lineage of um, what has happened to people, African-Americans today, and how that directly ties. So the town, which is now called Africa Town in Alabama, has, you know, ex of course, extreme poverty, but also these um, remnants of the, pe the person that was in charge and powerful at the time who commissioned this ship to be built, his family still owns almost all the property in this town, even though they don't live there anymore. And they have basically allowed um, big polluters, big, huge plants and corporations to build refineries and uh, paper mills and all these really heavy polluting companies that surround all the residents of this town who have high cancer rates, who continue to struggle with their health. Um, so it's like the remnants of slavery when people say things like, and not that anybody I know says this, but people should get over slavery. It shows that there's this direct line between what happened then and now. And it profiles all the different people in the town, people who are direct descendants of um, of some of the original, the last slaves that were ever brought to the U.S. And it also profiles some of the scientists and archaeologists who have gotten involved. There's a man who's absolutely fascinating in the movie, who's his his primary job is he is a deep sea diver, uh, 
archaeologist who goes around the world trying to find these old slave ships. Um, it gets into the history of how hard it is to find slave ships because it wasn't a practice. People, even then, they knew what they were doing was bad, so they would often try to hide the evidence of what they were doing. It's a really amazing documentary. Um, I can't highly recommend it enough. I was just completely interested. If you're a history buff, you would find this interesting. If you want to know more about African-American history, it's American history. Um, and the the film really uh, takes its time to explore, you know, what's going on with the town today and how the citizens are trying to change their lives for the better. I am happy with this one, unlike the last film I discussed. This one has been picked up for distribution. Actually, uh, Barack Obama, Michelle Obama's production company, Higher Ground, has picked it up and it will get released on Netflix. Um, so I'm super excited about that because I want as many people to see this film as possible. Well, it sounds fascinating and it sounds horrifying at the same time. I, it's, uh, I, I want to ask you a lot of follow-up questions. I know we're, we're uh, kind of under a time limit here, um, but I really look forward to seeing this one and hearing a bit more about it. The, the ongoing suffering from you know, our country's original sin uh, can never be underestimated. And, and uh, I just, I, if this is one of those films that I can tell is gonna be really heavy and hard to watch and I want to see it. So thank you for- um, Yeah, watching. definitely. Yeah, I can't wait to, hopefully we'll watch it as a group or something. We can do a virtual movie night. So yeah, that would on be to your next, next one. So my next film is much more lighthearted, although not, not comedy by any stretch, but um, is called Lucy and Desi. It's a documentary about Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz. Seems to be kind of, uh, uh, there's been a couple of films out recently that the Sundan at Sundance, there was another dr drama based on their life story. There's one that's already out, um, at least featuring a couple of days of the in the lives of Lucy and Desi. So they've been getting some, I think, overdue attention recently. This is the documentary um, uh, uh, directed by Amy Poehler, uh, who again, we're known, is known for comedy has directed some TV episodes and a few um, features, but this is her first dive into documentary film direction. Um, tells the story of Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz from uh, before they met through um, Desi and her death eventually. Um, and so it c covers the span of many, many decades of their relationship. Um, it's the story both of their relationship, which was challenging at times that it ended in divorce and yet they still loved each other to the very end. Um, they were the last people, um, Lucy was the last person Desi spoke to before he passed. Um, but part of what I appreciated about this is that there's a lot of their story that is underestimated and their impact on TV and film production in our country. Um, in addition to, of course, I Love Lucy, which I grew up watching that silly comedy on, you know, in old reruns on black and white. Um, yeah. They they went on to found a production company, Desi Lu Productions, that that revolutionized television in particular. They were the first. They they developed the idea of shooting multicam in front of a live audience, uh, which had never been done before. Uh, they created the rerun when Lucille mm -hmm. Ball got pregnant uh, halfway through the run of I Love Lucy. Uh, the network didn't want her pregnant on television so she took a maternity leave and they introduced reruns and proved that they would work and that audiences would watch again something they had maybe seen a year or two earlier um, they went on to produce star trek mission impossible the untouchables like 2000 if you go to imdb over 2000 productions have their name on they bought rko studios at one point but the story of lucy and desi is a fascinating story and um their success and what that did to their relationship was very interesting. And it was also a fascinating look at racism in, you know, at that time in television, because when Lucy, she had, she was becoming very popular, wanted to put on this show, this um, comedy about her and her husband, because Desi um, starred in that show with her, the network thought, no, he's, he's Cuban. We can't have an interracial couple on television. Right. And they had they literally toured the country putting on a variety show to prove to CBS, I think it was CBS television, that America would accept an interracial couple. And me as a child growing up watching I Love Lucy, it never dawned on me that they were an interracial couple. So, um, you know, they really proved that it didn't, you know, that that could be part of the comedy and that would be um, accepted by people. Anyway, I know we're running out of time. It's a it's enjoyable. No, it's great. I 
I'm really excited about this one. I really disliked the Being Ricardo's movie that Aaron Sorkin has out now. So this one I'm excited to see. It makes me, hearing you talk about it makes me think, oh, that's who should have directed the feature film was Amy Poehler because she's a comedic actress who understands why Lucille Ball was so important. That was the main thing that's missing from Being the Ricardo's is because he doesn't obviously think she's that funny. Lucille Ball was a comedy genius and Desi Arnaz was a really important musician. And I that's like completely lost in the new film. And so... Um, and the fact that they together revolutionized TV, that sounds really exciting. So I definitely hope that one is picked up. I'm sure it probably will be. It has been, yeah, it's, I think, picked up by Amazon, I believe. So it's coming. Okay, be yeah, <laughs> big surprise, Amazon. So yeah, I'll really look forward to seeing that one as well then. That sounds, I'm a big Lucille Fall, uh, Ball fan like you and loved the show on reruns growing up. So we'll move on to my last film, uh, which is uh, Marte Um or Mars One. Uh, by Gabriel Martins. This is a Brazilian film that follows the journey of a working class family as uh, President Bolsonaro, who is also sometimes referred to as the Trump of the tropics, um, takes power in Brazil. So it's a bit of a period piece, but just recent uh, history. It just happened a few years ago. Um, there's a mother and father. The mother works um, uh, as, a, as a cleaner and the father works uh, at, a, at a kind of upscale condominium type place doing like the l landscape and more. they're just hardworking people. There's, they have a young son who um, dreams of science and um, wants to be an astronaut and um, but his father wants him to be a soccer star. <laughs> And he's good at soccer. That's the funny thing. He's actually a really gifted athlete, but his dream is really to be in so the sciences. And then the the star of the movie really for me was Eunice, their daughter, uh, played by Camilla uh, D'Amato, who um, is at this crucial point. She's in college um, and she has met a woman that she's very much starting to fall in love with, who's a bit of a free spirit, who comes from a more of an upper crust family. And she's starting to feel like, should I start to leave my parents' house and explore this relationship with this woman? Should I come out to my parents? All these things are going on while there's sort of this political turmoil in the background. The political turmoil isn't focused on, it's more in the background to what's going on with the family. I really love this film, another one that has a beautiful look to it. And you just, it's one of these humanistic um, character pieces where, you know, the, the whole family are just, you really want the best for them. Um, and I, you know, like I said, I particularly loved the story of uh, Eunice, the daughter. I felt like her, um, the way it's played is uh, just really gentle and loving um, towards all the characters. Um, the director said in some of the talkbacks on Sundance that he wanted to make a movie for Black Brazilians, specifically who aren't shown as much in movies, um, but also for families, um, just to show, you know, a, a strong family unit that's loving while still having its problems and of course has a little bit of a political message so i highly recommend this film it was picked up by magnolia pictures which i'm excited about because they're a great independent film distributor so i'm hoping this will come to our local art house theater uh, when it comes out um, another really great film that i discovered through the film festival and this is the reason we go to film festivals right so indeed and hopefully someday we can actually go to film festivals again <laughs> hopefully but in the meantime it's nice to have this option to see all these great For films sure. so sure. i think that wraps us up is that correct scott i think yeah. that's my yeah we've got both done our three films and i know we're getting the cut yeah we're out of time so as well, thank you scott for joining me uh, on the show so great to have you as always go to our website realfilmsnobs.com we're on twitter and facebook we're all over the place thank you to our fabulous crew especially brad for taping the show our sponsors thank you have a great day and great movies Thank <laughs> you.